Hi guys, this is Kaylee. I'm in the time machine and I just wanted to add a little something to the beginning of this episode because September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And as you might have heard in some of our past episodes, Alexis and I are very pro-normalizing, seeking help for your mental health and your emotional wellness. And so I just wanted to take a minute to draw some attention to this because in the United States, over 16 million adults deal with major depression and 42 million adults deal with some sort of anxiety disorder, but only 25% of these people seek help. There's many organizations that you can look into for yourself or for others. There's a really helpful one called take5tosavelives.org. That's T-A-K-E 5 to save lives.org. Um, and it gives you some steps that really all of us can use every day just to sort of do our part for others and for ourselves. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, you just dial 988. You can save that to your phone um, for if you need it later. There's also a crisis text line. If you text SAVE to 741-741. You can also visit heartsandminds.nami.org. You can visit nih.gov or mentalhealth.gov. Um, and these are just resources for you or for others. If you want to educate yourself, because I think that we're all responsible for educating ourselves on these important issues, we want to do our little part to take the stigma away from seeking help for your mental health and your emotional wellness. There are a lot of great programs out there, finding resources near you. Um, so email us or check out these helpful resources and have a great day. Alexis, I think this week we should announce that we have some really exciting stuff coming up for season two. Yeah, we do. We are going to have some guests this season, um, at least here in the next few episodes, not this episode. But at least I, the next two, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the plan. We're going to have someone for episode three and episode four. Different people. Yeah. We're going to, and we're going to see how this goes. Um, we'd love to have people back. We'd have, we'd love to have more guest stars. Absolutely. And, you know, if people get into our, I want to say DMs, but we don't have DMs. If you want to email us <laughs> at to the blueberry podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> um, we, we would love to have you featured on the podcast, and I don't think it would be that hard to work other people in. So no. hit us up. This is going to be a blast, and I'm very excited to have to have our very own Jules and Lassiter, respectively, um, join us on this journey. Yes, hopefully that will be awesome, and I am so open to having other people join the podcast. I keep asking like my friends and my husband, and I've gotten... No luck yet, but it will happen. We will get more people onto the podcast. Correct me if I'm wrong. Your husband does sometimes watch with you when you're preparing for the show. He does a little bit. He did actually today. We re uh, I did my notes last night, and then he rewatched with me this morning, and he immediately went, he did it. And I was like, nope, that's the red herring. Good try. And then he was just like, ah. <sighs> So, uh, but he, we discussed he'd probably like the tone of like some of the season finales. Mm -hmm. So that would be lovely. And I'm, my husband doesn't usually watch with me, but you know, if, if we were like, hey, please come on the podcast, maybe he'd be cool with it. I don't know. We'll work something out. I would love that. I miss your husband. I miss hanging out with him. Okay. Well, uh, we should start the podcast. It's showtime. This is to the, the blueberry. I am Alexis, and I am a real life Gus. I'm her partner in crime, Kaylee, and I'm the real life Sean. And I have been stuffing my face, but I should be done now. So, okay, awesome. <laughs> we decided a while ago that we were going to start a psych rewatch podcast, so we would have a really good reason to talk to one another once a week. We've made it to season two, episode two. 65 million years off. Yeah. So the title, I mean, what age does that put that in? I don't think that's accurate. I think, I, and I'm ignorant. I definitely uh, made some crap up and put it in our last episode about Dale the Whale from Monk. 
Um, if you are an active listener of our podcast and you remember me talking about how Tim Curry might have been playing Dale the Whale at the same time that he was playing Nigel St. Not-So-Nice on uh, Psych, the answer is nope, I was way, way off. So, but I think dinosaurs were like 200 million years ago. Um, was that the Mesozoic era? I have no idea. I think maybe. Is there it, a Jurassic I think that's, era? Okay, 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 okay. So I think 65 million years ago was the extinction occurrence that wiped out 50% of all plants and animals. I think that might be the extinction um, that wiped out the dinosaurs. Okay, well then, yeah, that's actually accurate. Okay, okay, that's really exciting. Um, yeah. They're really good at not being accurate, much like me. Yeah, but they're really good about being sneaky, smart, and accurate too. Which True that. Is why I'm glad I finally Googled this all of a sudden. (laughs) We start with a flashback to 1987. And there is this giant, I'm going to say paper mache. I wrote papier mache. To scale. Because I am a French nerd. And that's how I've, that's, I've never talked about that art as anything but in French class. Like, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Never done it. But it's impressive. You've never paper mache before? No, I don't think so. I've like collaged, but that's not the same thing. I would recommend making a globe out of a balloon and paper mache. It's quite fun. Ooh, that does sound fun. We should do yes. that. <laughs> I digress. Okay, so giant two scale dinosaur T Rex head with little Gus number four inside of it. And all of the kids are going wild. Yeah, they're, they're like, ooh, but they're really quiet about it. They're, like, just getting out of his mm-hmm. way and just, like, in awe. And he walks in, and he's like, this t- – how long did it take Baby sh- baby Gus? Three, three months. Oh, my gosh. Three months to build a two-scale T-Rex head. Nerd alert. And apparently it was, like, dinosaur week at the school when everyone was supposed to do a dinosaur project because Gus was like, you didn't even do a project, did you, Sean? But he did. He did. And he goes, that took you like five minutes. And he's really salty. Baby Gus is just like, you are such a slacker. And Baby Sean is like, actually, it took me a whole hour. Thanks. How did it take him an hour? Because all he did was duct tape a dinosaur to a a remote control car. I (laughs) would. Okay. (laughs) Speaking of the Sean, glue might have been his first try. And it might not have worked out, but he wouldn't have known that until after he waited for it to dry and then saw that it didn't work out. And then you just got to go bust out the duct tape because that fixes everything, right? That's fair. Okay. So maybe that took him five minutes, but the whole trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loved Sean's remote control dinosaur. And Gus just looked at him and said, I hate you, Sean. Yes, yeah, salty baby Gus. Oh, Yes. At the Santa Barbara Police Department in present day, Lassiter is in interrogation. Oh, it just opens on a Lassie stare down, and it's going from Lassie to the perp, who's sweating and twitching, and back to Lassie, (laughs) who's staring, and back to the perp. And then the guy breaks fully. From Lassiter saying, Lompoc? I have no idea what he said. I did not write it down. I was like, that is nonsense. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. The caption spelled it L-O-M-P-O-C. And the guy cracks. All right, I did it. That's fine. All of the police officers are celebrating because this is his eighth case in a row that he has solved. Lompoc is a city in California. Oh, wait, actually. Sorry, I Googled it. Jules screams seven in a row. And Buzz goes, no, eight. The gas station guy confessed last week. (laughs) Buzz. I love Buzz. Buzz is back. I love him. I love when he's in the episode. Sean just has this gross face. And he's like, what is going on? And and he asks Juliet what's going on. Like, are people mad at him? Why has he not gotten any cases? They haven't called him for over a month. But they just haven't. We haven't really needed the help. Because Lassiter is literally on fire. Okay, but what are we talking about here? Like... Michael Jackson in the Pepsi commercial or the misuse of the word literally? (laughs) Kind of fire. (laughs) 
Juliet says to him, oh no, he's solved eight cases in a row. And Buzz came up and said, oh no, nine. I forgot about something. The Deshano case? There it is. And then Buzz is like, oh, hey, Sean. Sean's like, what the hell? The, we had, this is Lassiter we're talking about. The guy we had to green light for an entire episode last season. Really? Really? <laughs> I guess the first suspect on his last two cases cracked as soon as he brought them into interrogation. And Lassiter is smug about it. He is proud of himself and he is rubbing it in Sean's face. Sean is like, something is wrong here. And then Lassie is gloating. And then Chief walk, no, not Chief, but Sony walks up and is like, hey, we've got a body at the marina. And they're all like, boy, bye. <laughs> but then, <laughs> then uh, Lassie turns back to sad boy Sean and he's like, why don't you come with Spencer and see how the real police do it? Juliet kind of looked at him and said, what, there's no comeback here? That's... You should be embarrassed. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> like, how embarrassing for you? Sean's only answer is, you... Wh where, where'd you get to... Where'd you get that suit? The toilet store? And it's just like a oh. failed attempt at a burn that didn't even come out well. You hate to see it. And then we're at the marina. With Chief Vic, Juliet, Lassiter... And Sean kind of comes up alongside of them. And the first thing he sees that is that this guy has on like, like work boots, like yard in the grass, in the soil, like work, work boots. I honestly, I never caught that. I was never paying attention. I was like, yay, chief. And she's like, good luck with this one, Lassiter. Like, we've got no ID. We've got no reported missing people who match his description. Um, and Chief's not really happy to see Sean because there's something about a requisition for a segue <laughs> that she just found out was Sean. And it, he has solved cases that we never get to see. This is the implication. Like, there's stuff that we never get on this show. And I'm sad about it because it means there's more <laughs> that we could have. But... While they're going to look at the body, Sean kind of sneaks the notes from Lassiter. And he notices kind of two big things one that there are animal bites on the body but no one knows where the animal bites are are from because the radius of the bite is is 34 inches which is so pretty that's almost a three foot radius for an animal bite yeah that's like friggin' megalodon mouth okay so here is where gus walks up and he's like hey, what's this new case we've got? And Sean's like, um, there's a mistake you made there. And Gus is like, which part? And he's like, the got. He's like, I came all the way here from the office and we don't have a case. But Gus, we get our next. Gus, don't be a giant snapping turtle. <laughs> the case will be ours. <laughs> Just hold on. Um, so they're looking um, at the body. Uh, the cops are. And Lassie kind of notices his notes are missing. And he starts to, like, go, well, nothing in these waters has a bite radius this large. And, um... He thinks it's a boating accident. Yeah, he starts to do this sort of desperate breakdown thing because Sean is there and he's like, oh, no, you're not breaking my streak, Spencer. And he just starts going, uh, he fell in the propeller and then something and then uh, the giant crab trap. And I'm or like, whale. do you mean like a, tr like a troller? Like a... Trawler, whatever they call those. Sean steals his papers again, and he's like, oh, you really don't know what this was caused by? <laughs> and he starts to sketch, and then it just makes Lassie more desperate. And then um, Chief is basically like, let's let's look, take a look at what Spencer has. And he has this really wonderful T-Rex sketch, but we get this whole thing about, like, I'm not the, I'm not the artist that I want to be. And everybody laughs. Nobody understands why... It could be a T-Rex that, that got this guy. I mean, it's an extinct creature. And so Lassie, Chief Vic, and Juliet just walk away. And then Gus is just like, and walks away as well. And the scene ends with Sean saying, this is not a boating accident. I feel like there's a reference to something, but I don't know it. I Jaws is the only thing that I could think of, maybe, but I don't, I don't know if that's really it or not. Hmm. But then we get our credits. Sean and Gus are at the psych office, 
They're fighting about why Gus is mad, and Gus is not only mad, but he's been embarrassed by Sean. And they haven't had a case in over a month, and like they're gonna lose their business at this rate because Sean's saying nonsense, and they still don't have cases. And then Sean calls his real job a side project. Which gave me very, like, the time I offended you that badly vibes. And I was like, God damn it, Sean, don't make the mistake. <laughs> Sean's like, I can get the T-Rex into this picture somehow. I can, I can place a, a fake dinosaur by the body. I can, uh, you know, call in a roar or something. I know he has ways of making the T-Rex fit for his random theory he has ways of making his random theory fit when they do solve what's going on and he says he can play six degrees of separation with gus and a dinosaur right now and he's like wait you've never been in a movie with kevin bacon or a brassasaur i forget what he said yeah it was some side of random dinosaur that i quite enjoy <laughs> but then he kind of gets this this moment where he remembers what's going on and he's like I was canned from the Wyoming National History Museum for, like, for this little shot. And he holds up a picture of himself laying in the mouth of a T-Rex, like a T-Rex fossil. He said he had bruises for a year. And he thinks that those bites actually could be a match because they kind of looked like the bruises that he had. So Gus is like, you're starting to buy your own crackpot theory? Are you kidding? How are you going to match the bite? And Sean just goes, I need to borrow my dad's truck. (laughs) I'm like, we're going to prove it. So then we are at the medical examiner's. He's telling us that the victim didn't drown. There is evidence of blunt force trauma, which would have knocked him unconscious. And there's bruising and a broken rib consistent with a six, seven or eight foot fall. Um, We're getting some weirdness outside of the doors. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that Juliet and sees. While she's trying to answer something that was asked of her, I was not paying attention because I was like... Well, Lassiter, Lassiter said something like, this might be something from an oil rig. Let's check and see if there are any missing workers. Oh, uh, yeah, because work boots. Right. The work boots and the, the fall from a platform of some sort. And Juliet's trying to pay attention and says, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. And that's when Sean comes walking in wearing... Gus's giant paper mache T-Rex head. All right, everyone, let me through. I need to measure the bite. <laughs> Chief Vic is like truly worried about him. They go through this whole thing about them taking a leap of faith or something and taking a leap and she ends jumping the off the cliff. With, yes. That's she, what Sean she ends says, her yeah. whole thing with uh, seek help. Sometimes you have to jump off a cliff. You have to close your eyes. You have to unhook the clip chasses? Chassis? Chassis? Climbing, Climbing thing. things. <laughs> and you have to leap. And then finally, then Sean just walks out. He does not get to measure the bite radius against the T-Rex head. Um, and so he's taking the truck back to Henry's. So we're at Henry's and he walks in with the keys and Gus is there eating and... So they're all sort of just in the kitchen. I gotta ask a question about this because I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I was tracking my brain while I was watching this, and I know this doesn't hold true like 100 percent of the time because it doesn't hold true at the very end of this episode. But most of the time that Gus is at Henry's house, he's eating. Oh, totally! Like he's always like going through his fridge. Is that peach cobbler for everybody? Yeah. And <laughs> and there are five other cupcakes on a plate on this table and Gus is eating it with a fork off a plate. Yeah, cuz he's really first cool. of all. <laughs> sure. Um but uh they're not alone in the kitchen at Henry's. No, a guy named Doug Devet who is the SBPD psychologist is there. Psych on psych. Chief Vic asked him to check on Sean because she was worried about everything that was going on with him. And Sean just responds, what is this, some sort of intervention? Actually, yes. (laughs) You're (laughs) acting like a nut job, Henry says. 
Um, and then Sean talks about the dinosaur head and Gus is like, how'd you get my dinosaur head? My mom gave that to you? And Sean's like, yeah, along with some pictures that I'll let you pay me not to show your future significant others about when you went through your Terrence Trent Darby phase. (laughs) Which if you look up pictures, he's very pretty. I just don't think that Gus could pull it off. I had, I had different feelings about that. I was like, I think, I think that could be a thing. With the long, the long braids and the kind of like pretty face. Also, his big song was "Wishing Well," and I quite like that song. And I, I could see Gus singing that. I mean, look, Dule slash Gus, gorgeous, fine, but like, not pretty. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I guess I've heard it both ways. I'd like to see it tried, though. Yeah. I want to see those pictures. The dinosaur head's name is Danny Dino. Oh, I had no idea it had a name. How did I miss that? Because Gus said, you took Danny Dino? Mm. And I was just like, oh my gosh. So the, the psych guy, because I didn't write down his name like you did, um, says, I've heard you have delusions of magical powers. And Sean's like, really, Dad? Delusions? Delusions? <laughs> and he rounds on the guy. He's like, I've consulted with the SBPD and I have helped solve 18 cases this year. I have what five business cards assorted along with a mug to prove all of this. Yes. And um then he's like, "You know what? Spectacle time." And he reads the psych man to filth. First of all, he says that the guy's colorblind, which is true. Mismatched socks. Yeah. The next thing he says is that he's really stressed. Bitten fingernails. And there must be a reason for this stress. Oh, college is really expensive. There was a Pepperdine University brochure. Fun fact, I applied there. Did you? Yeah, it's in Malibu. Chief Vic and Lassiter come to the door, which is last, which is Sean's last spectacle. He said, door knock. And that's when Chief Vic and Lassie walk in. There has been a break in the case. The dead gentleman's name is Christopher Franzen. He's a paleontologist. Um, Sean looks blankly at Gus and he goes, dinosaur hunter. <laughs> Boom, said the lady. As expected. <laughs> they go to the professor's college. And Gus has this theory that they, they don't want to rule out the fact that there could be an island in the spe- in the Pacific. There could be an island in the Pacific somewhere where dinosaurs do exist. Because Jurassic Park is a true story? Sean said, and have an appetite for Jeff Goldblum. Who doesn't? I'm kidding. <laughs> they think it could likely be, the marks could likely have come from a model or something along those lines. So they're going to go to the archaeology department and kind of check out what they have that could be caused could have caused the marks during this walking talk i just wrote stripes because even though this is a less hideous shirt than the ones that we've been seeing it's a very bold stripe print shirt on gus so i noticed the stripes but i was like that's not really an ugly striped shirt that shirt looks pretty good on gus oh it totally does it's like orange and like dreamsicle and like different Mm -hmm. tones but it's not like satiny and like garish it just like is during this walking talk it was very apparent that he was wearing a bold stripe pattern so it's still a through line i'm still calling the stripes like a thing that's going on that's fair (laughs) they get into the department and they're looking at these quote-unquote artifacts and it's just like maybe five or six large pieces but yeah it's like a rib bone a partial piece of jaw like little stuff but like, yeah. they, I mean, they're big finds, but they're not whole pieces, you know? They also have some little tiny stuff, some trilopods tri- tri- up in a little box on the shelf. He says trilobites or something like that. And Sean goes, <laughs> Sean starts making Hellraiser references to the Cenobites and Gus um, kindly corrects him. <laughs> but these are movies that Alexis would never watch. So Yeah, no. No. 
Uh, the, the reference people, though, were Pinhead, Chatterbox, Surgeon, and Stitch. Yeah, these are the Cenobites who are demonic entities from another dimension. Um, don't watch those movies. Okay. <laughs> Sean is trying to tell Gus that he needs to fake the fact that he knows this stuff and he does a try one of these moves and he does like the psychic hand to head and Gus just smacks him because Gus is proud of his knowledge of his intelligence nerd alert but <laughs> um this kid whose name I did not write down uh this oh grad I think student, that was Ethan Ethan did I Ethan, not the, write that? the one who becomes the well right right I just didn't write down his whole name in this scene um i just know it's, I, I just think that was ethan yeah so it's a it's kind of a sad collection and ethan we're gonna we're gonna say his his name is ethan um divulges that you know franzen was always frazzled it barely paid attention didn't really try very hard in the classes he was teaching or the grad students he was supposed to be guiding he was really crappy and the department's about to go defunct and he didn't seem to give a crap and you should never take his class um he's dead oh well then totally that's where he that and he just like walks away yeah <laughs> like, okay but then um they look out the window and they see lassie and jules and they're like oh my god they're hot on our tail let's get out of here because they were like at least we found this first Lassiter is on fire literally <laughs> Then we go to the dead guy's house, and lo and behold, the cops are already there, too. And they're like, oh, my God. But I'm like, once they ID'd him, of course they go to his house first. That's what I was thinking. I was like, it would be wrong if they didn't beat him to the house. Have they ever beat, have Sean and Gus ever beat SBPD to the dead guy's house? I know they've beat him to crime scenes before, but if they already know who the dead guy is. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Uh... I think it does happen, but I don't know that it's happened yet. Okay. So um, I noticed in the scene, we have wet pavement, um, which <laughs> they're in California, LOL. Um, but I said, <laughs> rainy Canada. Um, <laughs> but Gus noticed, not Gus, Sean notices that uh, the guy's garage, this is a really cute neighborhood, by the way. Um, the guy's garage oh, yeah. has like a, like a little weird locky thing. So they go on a garage advent adventure off the beaten path. Um but as a rule, they don't commit B and E's. What are you talking about? The twenty, the twenty four hundred motel, the Ho de, hotel, the hotel de la Cruz, the spellmaster's box. They break into things all the time. <laughs> and but Gus said, or Sean said, like we just, I just don't feel like we should like pick this particular lock. And Gus is like, <laughs> you know, I want to pick this lock. Get out of my way. <laughs> which i feel like sean's doing a lot of reverse psychology on gus throughout this episode and this mm -hmm. is the first blatant example of it um i love i love gus's lock picking skills though because he like puts his hand up in this like really very drastic matter drastic matter and just starts pressing buttons and then we're going oh but but he starts squealing michael jackson noises are you channeling Michael Jackson? Um, Sean also calls him the Lock Whisperer, but G Gus does get them in with guessing that like digit code. He said. And, um, he said, "Who heard the second click?" And Sean said, <laughs> "I heard the second click." And that is a pop pop culture reference to the movie Safe Men from nineteen ninety eight. Thank you, Amazon. Of of course, because Gus is a right. Gus is a safe guy. <laughs> Okay, they get inside the barn shed thing, and it is dark. And Gus just pulls this flashlight out of his pocket. Now, it's not like a key ring flashlight, which I could justify him carrying around in his pocket randomly. But it is like a palm-sized small flashlight. I mean, that thing still is an inch, an inch or an inch and a half of diameter and like three inches long. Like, he just keeps that in his pocket all the time. I'm leaning towards yes. <laughs> Are you happy to see me or is that a flashlight in your pocket? Like that's, that was the moment. Like that was what my brain was at, but okay, fine. <laughs> Suggestive flashlight sizes. <laughs> um, 
he shines it in Sun's eyes. He's like, that's brighter than the sun. But um, it helps them find the light switch. They turn it on and there's so many bones and paraphernalia and there's gear missing. There are shovels, there's um, lighting equipment, there's brushes and cleaning equipment that you'd usually only use in a lab. Sean finds this picture thing and it looks like a tic-tac-toe board and Sean holds it up and said, I found something. He was the worst tic-tac player in all of the history of the world, in all the history of the world. And Sean really, or Gus doesn't really think this is important. He's like, put that's put that down. That's not what we're looking for. Doodles are not important here. Sean disagrees. <laughs> Lassiter and Juliet are there. They are ready and headed towards the barn. And Gus said... It's a garage. The, barn, <laughs> the garage, the shed, whatever it is. The barn in, in a neighborhood yep. in California. Yep. <laughs> that would stick out. So, you know, we had, a, we had a barn. And so I'm used to calling those extra areas barns. Okay. Oh, you... Yeah. Sean said, they are, have been five minutes behind us this entire time. Don't sleep in the noon tonight. They sneak out of the, of the shed. Lassiter and Jules walks up. They walk up behind Lassiter and Jules. And Lassiter said, having fun riding my behind? And Sean immediately said, definitely not in the nude. <laughs> yeah, right, Sean. You know you want it. <laughs> um, <laughs> they are like, we got to get somebody to crack this. And Sean's like, wait, I can crack it. And so he has them back up and back up and back up and back up. And then he's like, Gus, give me the code. Give me the code. Please do it. Please do it right now. I'm making a spectacle. Please help. And um, Gus does. But only little by little. After Sean promises him his Tony Randall. I'm sorry, not, not Tony Randall. His Tony Quinn rookie <laughs> card. Which is a baseball <laughs> card. Although a Tony Randall card would be funny. <laughs> it would look like Lassiter. No. Okay. So little by little, we get the code. 25329. And. Oh, sorry. Um, I wrote Sean's funny wall landing. Oh, yes. Because Gus shoves him and he lands dramatically looking like a chalk outline of a murdered person, <laughs> but on a wall. And this is, this is a running bit of a thing that he does. So this will be fun. There is a moment, though, where Lassiter looked at him and said... I'll give you that one. Like, Lassiter was actually very impressed that he was able to psychically divine the codes. He's like, I'm running this show, but props. So then he, like, walks on in, and then he notices all the same missing stuff. And um, then he comments on the fact that, like, this guy's truck isn't here. Uh, I think it's still at the university. But if we find this truck, it's going to give us a clue to where this guy is. Um, yeah, find the truck, find the murder weapon. That's what they think. Yeah, and so Sean goes, Gus, can't believe you missed the truck. He goes, I'm not the psychic. And then we get one of those really funny moments. I can't even do it well. <laughs> I don't know. One of those noises. Yeah. But as they're getting ready to leave, Sean saw this fruit box from Oh Hi. And was like, why would this guy have fruit boxes? Why would he go to a fruit stand that's over 50 miles away? It really makes me want to go to a fruit stand. Like, the best fruit at a roadside fruit stand. I'm not trying to spoil anything at the moment, but I spent so long staring for pineapples in this scene. BTW, everyone. Mm -hmm. They're not there. <laughs> because then we're at the fruit stand and they're not there um they're asking the fruit stand owner whose name i don't think we get um but he says the 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 missing guy they the murdered guy is um was one of his best customers and they say you know do you know where he was going do you know where he went and he was like he was my last customer of the day and he went up the hill and sometimes early in the morning when i was opening up i saw him come back down the hill they were pretty, pretty impressed, pretty happy with what they got. And the scene ended with Gus saying, uh, Sean said, do you have any more questions for him, Gus? And Gus said, yes. Is that peach pie in the back? Hmm. So we got a Gus asking for peaches again. 
moment. Ooh, I'm still saying, yeah, because Peach Cobbler last episode. That that's a that that's a running joke, which we get to more in the next scene. So we're driving and driving, and then the blueberry pulls up, and Gus goes another dead end. But Sean notices there's like an exposed um like fence joint, and so they they park and they walk up and they move the fence and they're able to get through. And they're just in this open field area that doesn't look like it's used for anything. It's part of the and there's like... Deacon Walker Farms. That's what the farm is actually called that they're headed up to. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that'll that'll come into play a lot pretty soon. But, so they're walking, 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 and they kind of turn this, like, bend around, like, a little thatch of, like, trees. And there's all these, like, filled-in dig spots. And Sean just goes... Kind of like that Sigourney Weaver movie, huh? <laughs> With all the holes. Aliens? <laughs> Alien? No. Alien Resurrection. Resurrection. <laughs> and then... And then he's like, no, no, the one where John Voight's walking around all crazy. Oh, Anaconda. No. Gorillas in the Mist? Sh- Gus. Death and... Death and the Maiden. Half Moon Street? <clears throat> Okay, we're done with that. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't Kaylee, everyone, saying that to me. That was what Sean said. That was Sean. I was being Sean. That was so many <laughs> rapid God. fire. So many rapid fire pop culture references. The most beautiful one is the one that they make, but don't actually reference, which is Holes, in case anyone missed it. Because Dooley Hill was in it. Where he, where he was the harvester of the peaches. Oh, because there was a whole part where he was like, no, no, the one with the holes that they have to dig and the Shia LaBeouf. And Gus just goes, there were holes in Shia LaBeouf? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we're walking around and shots fired. Lots of shots fired. It sounds like a shotgun firing. Which is wonderful because then we get a Sean and Gus run screaming like little girls. <laughs> and then Gus falls down a hill. Sean screams, Gus, run like the wind! So they get back to the blueberry, and Gus is keeping his head down, and he's driving the blueberry backwards very quickly. And Sean's like, what are you doing? We're away from the shots. And they weren't even shooting anywhere near us. And Gus basically says, what goes up must come down, and don't argue with me about physics. (laughs) Sean said, Sean said, are you trying to, or do you know what the trajectory, do you know what the trajectory, trajectory do you know what the trajectory of that would have to be in order for them to hit us and that's when gus says don't you dare argue physics with me not while we're in the process of being killed and then they pass a sign that says trespassers will be shot <laughs> did you notice the spy music that was playing? Uh, yes i didn't write it down but i did notice that's very exciting um gus is very salty because uh he knows that sean saw that sign before they went to there and they went to there anyway mm-hmm and then we're at the SBPD. They end up in Chief Vic's office. And got, Sean starts making chicken sounds. He's getting something. Here. And, uh, and then he kind of chicken heads all the way across the room. Yeah, he's it, it, like doing the chicken bob. I, yeah. Okay, I'm freakishly good at that. It's another... <laughs> You're actually quite good at making chicken sounds because I would have just said cluck cluck, so it worked out. <laughs> I'm the Sean. But he, he it's a cluck cluck here and a cluck cluck there. Here a cluck, there a cluck. And Chief Vic's finally like, I got it. Are you going to tell me that there's a farmer named McDonald? No, but there's a farm. And it's uh, uh, M- M- McShooty Pants. It's not his real name. Farmer Shooty Pants. <laughs> Um, and then they're interrupted by, is it Lassie and Jules? I didn't write mm-hmm. it down. Yeah, Lassie okay. and Jules. And Lassie says, um, we found the truck at the marina. Just had a hunch. Brushes his shoulder off a little bit. And he's like, um, and there's a print. And it belongs to one Ethan Robinson. Bum, which bum, is bum. disgruntled grad student. But like, disgruntled for a reason. And... I don't think he remembered the guy was dead. He wasn't, like, talking about him in the past tense. So, to me, that's not sus. It's like, yeah. you know, if you're already talking about someone you didn't know was dead in the past tense, that's sus. This is the guy who Drew saw and immediately said, oh, it's him. It, it wasn't <laughs> him. 
They did find, however, like a stack of letters from Ethan Robinson, and one of them said, stop ruining my life. Well, he was ruined. Like, this kid is clearly passionate about archaeology and paleontology, and this guy, like, didn't care, wasn't paying attention. And it truly, the money that you spend to go to grad school, and when you have passion for something and someone's ruining the whole experience and just wasting your time and money and crushing your dreams, like, sure, he can write an angry letter. I'm not mm-hmm. mad at him for that. Nope. Neither, uh, neither is Sean, apparently, because Sean is like, no, I th- I, there has to be more. Well, what, a- what about the digging? What about the farm? And, and he's, what, the Wap, what, what's the guy's name? What's the farm? Oh, Deacon Walker Farm. Yeah, we talked to them yesterday. The guy was very forthcoming. No reason for him to be a suspect. Apparently, Christopher Franzen had made a number of calls to Deacon Walker Farms and, you know, had had talked to the farmer and the farmer told them all about it. And there's nothing sus there, so they don't really care. Yeah, he wanted to lease some of the grounds of Deacon Walker Farm and the farmer just didn't want to lease it to him. He was very forthcoming. No big deal. Um, so that scene kind of ends with uh, Sean's dreams being crushed again. no. That scene ends with a Lassiter Juliet fist bump. Oh snap! This Good is catch. our this is our only fist bump of the episode, and it's Lassiter and Juliet. Still counts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we're at Henry's, and I just wrote Dino thing. What did I? Oh, uh, Henry said, "Are you still on that dinosaur thing?" Ah, yes, yes, yes. Because they want to borrow his digging tools. Henry absolutely says no. He said, I cannot support you going somewhere where you could be shot. Aww. I know feelings. And then... Yeah, he's actually being very open and vulnerable with how he's feeling. He's like, Sean, this is dangerous. You're putting yourself in, in unnecessary danger. Um, I'm getting a bad feeling about this. There's something off. And I know feelings. Like... This is in my gut. This is my emotions. Like, you could get hurt here. But they do it anyway. Oh my god, though. Okay, that was big. That was so big. I loved it. It, it, was, it, was, a true, it was a true moment of, of Henry sharing his feelings in a, in a super, super vulnerable way. Instead and like, of, like, very, his yeah. Passive. He's, he's always very passive about it before. Or he's very angry and hiding it behind something else. And I love this. I love this for Sean and I love it for Henry. And it ends too soon because then we go to the farm again. Mm-hmm. Regardless of Henry's feelings, we don't ask Henry to come with us. Like, yeah. They get to the farm and they just kind of see all the holes everywhere. And... Gus said, I don't think this is random. Paleontologists dig with reason. And then Sean remembers the doodles that he was looking at. And he's like, those weren't tic-tac-toes. They were a grid formation. So he superimposes his, his, it's very Queen's Gambit, if anyone has seen that show. He superimposes the tic-tac-toe doodles over the holes to find the one where O marks the spot. Because there's no way he had that many finds. So X's mean misses. And there's only mm-hmm. one O on the grid. So they track it down. And it's the only one that has, like, fill marks from a bulldozer. Like, track right. marks. And no one would... No, no good paleontologist would ever use a tool so indelicate. Indelicate. Yeah, Gus is like vehemently, like this doesn't track. This is wrong, all wrong. The gents decide they're gonna dig that hole, and the so they gents. Start. The gents, the gentlemen. That that was fucking cute. I'm oh. like, <laughs> you caught me with that. I was like, let's do it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I I don't know if anyone has noticed, but I was calling them the boys. And then I felt kind of bad because they're not boys, they're grown men. And so I they got to this boys. point <laughs> where I called them gentlemen. And then I was like, okay, the gents. We'll go with the gents for the moment. We'll, we'll, I don't oh. know, we'll probably get back to everything. But the gentlemen decide that they're going to dig up this one hole that was marked with an O. And time just kind of passes. We see the time pass and we cut back to Gus still digging 
screaming at Sean, hey, how's it going over there? And Gus is out of, and Sean is out of the hole, sitting at the top of the hole, taking a nice little rest. He's like, I'm keeping a watch. That's how that other guy got killed. (laughs) And (laughs) And then Gus throws a shovel at him. A shovel just lands on his abdomen. And I'm like, that is so scary. Don't do that. Also, this is such a stupid little thing, but I found it very funny. They both have on working gloves. Gus has on, like, manly, like, welder's working gloves. And Sean has on flowery gardening gloves. (laughs) Both of which they probably stole from Henry, by the way. (laughs) So. (laughs) It was just kind of a really funny thing. Because I saw it. I saw Sean's gloves and I was like, those are super cute little flowery gloves. And then I looked and I was like, Gus has man gloves. Okay, okay. <laughs> I think those are like those are like tree trimming gloves versus like pulling weed gloves. Yes, yes. We- Weeds, pulling weeds, not weed. <laughs> <laughs> we have tree trimming gloves because like they're good for thorns and stuff. But definitely if you want to protect your nails, would recommend some pulling weeds gloves. They are both digging they get to the bottom of the loose dirt and Gus is like, be careful. Um, I, I, we're at the bottom of the, the loose dirt. It might be something. And he feels something hard. And he gets down and starts brushing stuff away. And he realizes this is, this is fossil. This is the find. But it looks like it's already been processed. There's been rock particles chipped away. It's been like, like, I don't know, Mm well-treated in a way that, like, you would usually find after the fact when it's in a lab. But Sean says maybe it was too big. Does Sean say that? I think Sean says I'm getting the leaf blower. It was Sean. He's like, you you have a leaf blower? (laughs) So, again, Alexis thinking kind of funny, but the blueberry's not huge. But the blueberry has all those shovels, the gloves, and a leaf blower in it? Yeah, it's a leaf blower that has a backpack. So yeah, it's a legit like... leaf blower. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if ours is that legit. Um, after the dirt storm, it's an exposed T Rex head. Like it's, it's the mouth hole that that we knew was going to be there. And Gus said, "I just discovered a dinosaur." <laughs> we get to the next scene. The gentlemen are laying on the floor in the psych office, absolutely tired out of it. And Gus is not happy that they filled in that hole again after was, all that work. It was a terrible idea, but they had to they had to leave it so that they could discover it as part of the psychic re- revelation later on. Gus is confused because if paleontologist man went to the farmer with this, it would mean millions of dollars, you know, like really incalculable, amazing, like archaeological and paleon- paleontological, I don't know, paleontologist, I don't know, <laughs> dinosaur fossils and finds. He's like, why, why would he say no? It's, it's not on land that he's obviously using for crops. Um, it's worth all this money. Like, this is sus, right? There's more to this. Yeah. Why wouldn't he just lease the land? So Sean kind of just goes, let's ask him. We'll be vacuum salesmen. No, no. We'll do of mice and men. I'm Lenny. You are not Lenny. (laughs) (laughs) I strongly caution anyone who has never read the uh, novella. It's very short. uh, Of mice and men. Or seen the movie that I think Sean is referencing where it's Gary Sinise and um, John Malkovich. John Malkovich is Lenny. Um, Don't, if you don't like to cry hysterically. I will not watch it. Steinbeck is a emotion murdering motherfucker. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The great American novel is depressing as hell. Um, But yeah. And that's a short one, so you, you'll be tempted to start with that to break into Steinbeck, and I do not recommend. Okay. They decide that they are going to go up to talk to the farmer, and they're going to pretend like they're from the National Paleontological, Paleontologist 
society or something. But first they stop at the fruit stand again. They ask if uh, Deacon Walker's farm ever, like, sold food, sold fruit for the fruit stand. And the guy said no. Or, I'm sorry. No, not now. They used to, but they don't, they don't farm anywhere near as much as they, they used to. So we do it all ourselves. It kind of just turns into this whole uh, citrus versus stone fruit sort of thing where Gus is trying to point out that peaches aren't citrus and that John is stupid. Everything's good. They decide that they're going to head up the hill and see what they can find. And again, are there any other questions? And Sean said, my friend and I would like to buy every peach you have on the truck. And Gus said, including the one you're eating. Oh my gosh. I remember that. We get that as the scene is fading out. And then we're at the farm and they're having a argument about ulna placement because sean says that's not in your arm and gus says i promise you it is because if he does lenny he's gonna give him an indian burn so hot that your socks will catch fire (laughs) you can't burn my bone whatever so they walk up and they knock on the door and the guy answers and they say deacon walker and he's like i'm sullivan walker and they're like oh can we speak to deacon walker and he says there isn't one The story is that his name is Walker. He used to have a partner named Roger Deacon, but he's not his partner anymore, hence Deacon Walker. And that's when Gus introduces themselves, saying, we're from the National, and he immediately just says, not interested, and slams the door. Yeah, he does get paleontological, paleontological. I don't, he gets, he gets part of the word out, and the guy slams the door in his face. Why can't I say that word? What is that word? I don't think I know what the word is, so just just keep saying paleontological. (laughs) They knock on the door again. Sean said, we are willing to make you a very hefty offer, slams the door. (laughs) So Sean knocks one more time. And when the guy answers, Sean's face is pressed up against the door and he goes, hi, I'm Lenny. I'm like, and he slams (laughs) the door again. They kind of figure that they are at their wit's end. Sean does say, do you think if we knock, he'll open a fourth time? They decide not to. But then they notice that there are holes near the farmer's house. And Sean's like, why did he, why did Francis or whatever, why did the paleontologist also dig up here? And they walk over and they start checking out the holes and they notice that all of those holes had been dug with a bulldozer. So they realize that the farmer's also been digging on top of the digging that the paleontologist has been doing. So it's to the blueberry. They're headed to the blueberry and Henry calls and said, are you at that farmhouse? Of course, Sean lies. No, of course not. Henry says, good, stay away. I know where I know that name from. Deacon Walker Farms. 20 years ago, a woman said that her boyfriend named roger deacon has gone missing and he was never found the farmer said something about him moving back to england or something like that yeah sus um sean ended the call with well i might be looking at him and then just hangs up the phone and henry is worried he's at the pier in santa barbara he starts like yelling he slams his phone and he starts moving it really quickly and then we're at sbpd and um Lassie's talking to Chief. He's like, yeah, it turns out all the evidence we have is kind of circumstantial. I, I still feel like this could be our guy, but I'm not as confident as I want to be. Um, and then Jules rushes in and says, we just got a call from Sean Spencer. And he says that we need to meet him at a farm in Ojai. And they're like, what? He, she's like, listen, he says it's serious. And if we go there in 10 minutes, he can both solve our case and present us evidence solve another um murder case and unearth a dinosaur (laughs) it was he guarantees that in 10 minutes he can solve the case nab the killer close another additional or or close an additional unsolved murder and unearth a dinosaur thanks that's the part we're keeping um (laughs) so chief is like alrighty then (laughs) juliet and Lassiter are at the farm with Sullivan. They're kind of out in the... At the whole site. Yes. Yeah. They're out in the, that area. And Chief Vic, Sean and Gus walk up. And the farmer just goes, Lenny? 
<laughs> I didn't think of Lenny. But we, we're starting to get our breakdown. Like, from here, it just sort of cascades. So, <clears throat> he starts talking about um, the mystic vibrations of the sea. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> I don't have a lot of this breakdown written down like I remember what happens, but if you have more written down, help. <laughs> so, yeah, you go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll check in. Okay, so basically he's like, the paleontologist found something, and you couldn't have anyone, let alone him, digging on your land, let alone finding something. And then you knew it was only going to get worse, so... So you've refused to let him dig, but like a good paleontologist, he did it anyway. That's when he found something. But you didn't want him digging here. Yeah, you didn't want anyone digging. And then if once he found something, you knew you were in trouble and you had to end this because that would just bring people... And then Henry shows yeah. up. <laughs> he like totally crashes the party and Sean's real salty. And Henry's like frantic. He's like... I didn't know you were smart enough to call for backup. Otherwise, I wouldn't rush all the way here because I thought you were in danger and putting yourself in danger. As Sean is just about to break the fact that Roger Deacon was dead, Henry goes, oh, that makes total sense. Deacon is buried on the property. Dad, they don't know he killed his partner who's been missing for 20 years. I was just about to get to that. He does a full on like little kid, Dad. They, he he said, yeah, they killed Deacon. He killed De Deacon. He buried it on the farm somewhere, and he can't remember where the body is. So he can't have people swarming his property, digging up the body, and proving he committed murder. Which okay, so this is what happened in our first Rich Daddy episode too. It's like, oops, committed murder. Must commit more murder to hide it. Like, no. Nah. Sorry, did, you're getting caught. He, Sean did look at the farm and say, the farmer and say, isn't that right, farmer shooty pants? Which is what he called farmer earlier. He Love killed it. Franzen by hitting him over the head with one of his digging tools. When he fell, he fell into the hole and landed on the dinosaur's teeth. And that's where he got the bruises from. But he couldn't leave him in that hole because Franson had been calling the farm, had been snooping around the farm, and there was a connection between him and the farm. So they had to take him and dispose of him in a way that would kill the forensics. And they say, oh, I also wrote that, like, the um, detectives were slowly surrounding McShooty Pants, um, like, while the breakdown was happening, which I thought was, like, really smart and, like, a very small thing. It's like they just, like, end up on either side of him. He's like, I don't have to listen to this. And Lassie's like, y you do, though. And then, um, I, is it Jules or Chief who says, I have a bad feeling about your streak? It's Jules, yeah. And he's like, you're not the only one. <laughs> Farmer Walker said, I think I need a lawyer. And Lassiter said, yeah, I think you do. Put your hands behind your back. And so they do end up arresting him. There's another, there's another um, Henry kind of busted the moment. Oh, why did, but it was earlier. It was why, why was he digging around the house? And he said, well, because he can't remember where the body is. But we're not done. For my last trick, I will discover a dinosaur. And Gus is like, what? I will discover a dinosaur. He hands Gus the shovel and says, Gus will discover a dinosaur. And then Gus looks at the hole that he's about to dig and he goes, wait a second. You're just trying to get me to dig this hole for you. Forget about it. So Sean so they goes. Both, they both start digging. They both start going. <laughs> Whoever finds it gets to name the dinosaur. Oh my gosh. I'm going to name it Zippy or Chompy. Zippy the dinosaur. Discovered by Sean Spencer. Psycho paleontologist or something like that. Very cute. And then we're back at the SBPD, and sadly, Buzz is erasing the whiteboard that had Lassie's streak written all over it. Everybody, it's just like frowns all around. Everybody is upset that Lassie's streak is over. Everyone is sad that they can't keep celebrating it. And Lassiter mm -hmm. said to Juliet, I am doomed. I am never going to expect an extinct creature. I should just give up now. 
Juliet said, all streaks have to end. Lou Bordero. Lou Bordero? Lou Bordero? Lou Boudreau. Fielded the ball clear, cleanly. My gosh, I can't even get that part. You have to let it go. And Who's Lou Boudreau? He recorded the out that ended DiMaggio's hit streak. It's like, why do I care about something from 70 years ago? <laughs> Juliet says it was 66. Lassie's. But I was getting poker poker advice vibes from this part. Is like, you know, no matter how good you are, there's always going to be somebody better. It's like the streak is always going to end. Like, don't don't mourn it. Just celebrate that it happened. <laughs> As Henry. Nope. Not Henry. As Lassiter is walking, looking sad, Juliet said, do you need a hug? No. <laughs> Juliet just makes this face like, mm-hmm. what do I look like? Wait for it. And then he says, yeah, I'll take that hug. And like he comes back into frame and she gives him a hug. We end up coming to Henry's house where Sean, Sean walks into Henry, Gus, and Doug, Doug the psychologist. And as I said before, Gus is in Henry's house, so he's eating. A pineapple? Pineapple. He is. I missed that. He is 100% eating slices of pineapple. You can see the green edge. You can see the yellow, the yellow fruit. Damn. Okay. So I was really, I was like, wait, Mr. Intervention Guy is back. And, and Sean walks in and he's literally like, wait, we're doing this again? Seriously? And Henry's instantly like, yes, Sean, because you're not taking responsibility for your actions or your choices and you're putting yourself in needless danger. And, but, 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 wait a second, because Psych Guy says, Actually, Henry, I might have flubbed the truth a little bit here. Um, we're not here for Sean. This is for you. Did you really drive all the way up to Ojai to crash Sean's crowning moment? Are you kidding me right now? Get out of my house. Get out. Out. He goes very like roar Henry mode. And I'm just like, he had, okay, he had the most earnest dad vibes ever in this episode and he sean is punishing the hell out of him for it because he's saying like you try to control everything about everybody's lives and blah 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 and then so henry kicks everybody out of the house (laughs) and that's how the episode ends and that's how that ends (laughs) this episode is so i'm gonna use the word lighthearted. i quite enjoy it it's just like an easy watcher like like, it wasn't super deep. Yeah. There were some pop culture references, but there weren't, like, a thousand like there were in the last episode. There really weren't any, like, really heavy moments. There was that beautiful moment between John and Henry where they bond and Henry actually starts to show his true feelings. But overall, it was just good. It's, like, worth watching. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Was there anything that we missed? I don't know. You tell us. Our email is... To the blueberry podcast at gmail.com. It's very easy to remember because our podcast is called To the Blueberry. It is a podcast and Gmail makes sense. To the blueberry podcast at gmail.com. Also, if you do listen to our podcast out there and you have a psych friend, we would love for you to share our podcast with your psych friend. You can even leave us a review on Amazon Podcasts or like Apple Podcasts. Sure. Like we're there and it would. Help us be found. I mean, you don't have to give us a glowing review. Just write, hey, they like the show. Five stars. Like, that would be awesome, you know? Yeah. That would help (laughs) us end up further up on the the tracks. Um, But that's also a reason why you might need to share, because it's kind of hard to find our podcast at the moment. You can. But if you share and more people start to listen, it's easier to find. Yeah. Too true. Cool. That's all I got, honestly. (laughs) In that case, I am Alexis, and before I give my quote, I must say that this quote I picked specifically because in this moment, Gus is my spirit animal, where he said, don't look at me, I'm here for the cupcakes. And I'm Kaylee. Doodles are the windows to the soul, Gus. 
Or maybe that's the epiglottis? Where's the uvula? <laughs> and this has been... To, to the, the blueberry. blueberry! Psych out. <laughs>